all stand? It's great to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Why don't you lift your hands and let's invite the presence of the Lord into this place. God, we thank you today. God, for your grace and for your mercy, O oh Lord. Lord. We're thankful for another opportunity to gather in your house, O oh God, to give you praise, to glorify your name. God, we ask that you would move in this place tonight. God, let your spirit reign in this house. We'll give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name and let the church say amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now? Amen. Is he worthy of all the praise and all the glory? Amen. Join in and sing with us tonight. I feel Jesus.
Don't you feel his presence in this house right now? Why don't you just lift your hands and entertain his presence for just the next few moments? God, we thank you for your goodness to us. God, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, oh God. God, we thank you for your presence that we feel in this house today.
magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you cared for me. It's such a special way, and now I praise you. I lift you up, I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Sing it with us one more time. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me It's such a special way And now I praise you I lift you up I magnify your name That's why my heart is filled with praise So I'll praise you I lift you up magnify your name that's why my heart is filled with praise could we just go ahead and do that for a few moments here today could you lift your hands and could you offer up a sacrifice of praise to our God come on he's worthy hallelujah 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 God, we bless your name and give you praise. We glorify you. You're a mighty God. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Good to be back at Calvary. And uh, good to be in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night. Amen. Turning your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 22. Good to see all of you again. And uh, great things are happening in Virginia. We're seeing a great move of God. Please remember to keep us in prayer and uh, come see us. Genesis chapter 22, verse number one. Uh, I gave I gave the uh, audio visual my text tonight, and uh, I won't say who it was, Raymond. But uh, my God, Pastor's already got to you, hadn't it? So I don't know what that means, but uh, I guess it's a long text tonight, so I apologize. Genesis 22, 1 through 14. Came to pass after these things, God did tempt Abraham, said unto him, Abraham, he said, Behold, here am I. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, clave the wood for the burnt offering, rose up, went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac. His son took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. They came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. 
And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. I want to talk to us for a few moments tonight from this subject, the temptation of Abraham. Would you put your Bible down and would you help me to pray that God would speak to us out of his word tonight? Could you lift your hands and lift your voices? Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We are so indebted to you. Thank you for your long suffering, your kindness to us. God, I pray that the presence and power of God would fill this house tonight, that your glory would be on display, that there be a manifestation of your spirit, that the anointing of your of your spirit would be in this house and the glory of God would be revealed in all that we do and say in Jesus name Amen you can be seated I want to talk to us tonight about a few of the things that have jumped out to me out of this text uh, that I, uh, I hope that uh, God will speak to you through uh, a very uh, familiar passage of Scripture. Abraham is tested taking uh, his son to a place of burnt offering and sacrifice and worship. And uh, so I want to talk to us just about a few things that jumped out to me. And the first thing that I want to talk about is found in the very first verse of Genesis chapter 22. Uh, the Bible said God was the one that tempted Abraham. God tempted him. God tested Abraham. That literally the events of Genesis 22 were orchestrated by God. And I know that in our thought processes there usually when we, we, we think about the idea and the concept of temptation, um, we don't often correlate that to a, uh, a, a God origin. Um, that, uh, and I understand why we, we believe that, but there is a, a difference between uh, the temptations. James says it like this in James chapter 1. He said, God does not tempt anyone to sin. And so we have to know the difference because the temptation from Satan, those temptations are designed to make you fail. But temptations from God are designed to give you faith. Temptations from Satan are designed to make you sin. But temptation from God is designed to make you strong. Temptation from Satan is designed to ruin. But temptation from God are designed to revive. So I want to point out tonight that God was the one, in Genesis 22, who instigated the temptation, the testing of Abraham. And the, the, the second thing that I want you to understand out of this text is the notable absence of a response from Abraham to God's request. When you read Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 2, when God's talking to Abraham, he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. 
whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. The writer does not give us any indication that there was a response from Abraham to the request of God. Verse number 3, immediately following verse 2, Abraham rises up early in the morning, takes the donkeys, takes his servants, gets Isaac, and begins to make the trek, the journey to the place of worship. Now, I want to contrast this for just a moment tonight from the story that you can read just four chapters prior in Genesis chapter 18. Because in Genesis chapter 18, you find where that God tells Abraham, I am going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You're familiar with that story tonight. And immediately after the judgment of God is pronounced on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham immediately asks God the question, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? God, what if I can find 50? What if there are 50 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, would you spare the cities if there were 50 righteous? And God responds back to Abraham, okay, if I, if I find 50 righteous, I'll, I'll spare the city. And, and we know the story how that Abram, Abraham goes down the list from 50 to what if there's 45? What, what if there's 40 or 30? What, what, God, what if there's 20? What if there's 20 righteous in the city? And he begins this negotiation with God. God, what if there's 10? Now, go back to Genesis 22. We are four chapters later. God says to Abraham, take your only son, the son that you love. Go down to the land of Moriah, which literally means the land of divine service, and offer him as a burnt offering. And there's silence from Abraham. Dead silence. Abraham gets up the next morning, saddles the donkeys, gets his two servants with him, and off they go without so much as even the mention of a peep out of Abraham. He goes from a vehement negotiation with God on behalf of strangers in a sinful city to a stunning silence on behalf of his son. Abraham, why are you not negotiating with God for your son. This is the son you love. Nothing, Abraham? Really? Not, not even a word to God. God said, take your son and go. The son you love, go down to the land of Moriah, offer him up as a burnt offering, and there's nothing for a response from Abraham. You guys know how my mind works. That perplexed me. And I, I needed to ask God, what is it about the difference between these four, just, just four chapters later, we have in Genesis 18, we have the vehement negotiation with God on the behalf of strangers in a sinful city to nothing on behalf of his beloved son. And it was like the Holy Ghost dropped it into my mind. 
There was no promise attached to Sodom. The difference between the negotiations was with Isaac, I've got a promise. I can go back to Genesis 12, and, and, I, and I, 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 he's called me the father of many nations. That out of Isaac and that, out of that seed, is gonna, I'm going to become the father of many nations. And there's a promise attached to Isaac. And I can suffer in silence because I know I have a promise. Hebrews writes it like this, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said uh, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up uh, even from the dead, uh, from whence also he received him uh, in a figure. And so I, I just got to tell somebody today uh, when we're talking about temptation, uh, the temptation of hell will reveal the power of a problem uh, while the temptation of God uh, will reveal the power uh, of a promise. All that Abraham had, even as he walked in silence for three days, ready to take his only son, the son he loved, the only thing he had left was a promise. Can I tell somebody here tonight uh, that a new dimension of worship uh, is revealed uh, when I can sacrifice my future on the hope uh, of nothing but a promise. Uh, can I tell you today, uh, you will reach a whole new dimension of worship uh, when you can say, take this whole world, uh, just give me Jesus, uh, and I can sacrifice uh, my hopes, uh, my dreams uh, on the altar of just the hope of a promise. He gets to the place in the land, Moriah, the God that showed him. He tells his young man there in verse number five, you stay here. I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And then listen to what he said here. And come again to you. When it's just you and the promise, there has got to be something within the heart and mind of every believer that declares the prophetic voice of restoration. For three days, Abraham has traveled under the weighty mantle of the prophetic. I'm probably not going to have the answers for the questions that you may have. But the fulfillment of my promise hinges on my ability to journey from obedience into the prophetic. Can I tell you that the temptation from Satan will produce the pathetic, but the temptation from God will produce and reveal in you the prophetic. And Abraham could tell them, you two stay here. You stay with the donkeys. The lad and I will go yonder to worship. Well, there's something you got to understand here, boys. He and I are coming back. There was the mantle of prophecy that rested upon the shoulders of Abraham as he looked those boys in the eyes. They didn't know where the sacrifice was coming from. They didn't know where the answer was coming from. But the prophetic voice of God thundered through the throat of Abraham when he said, we will be back. And we are not coming back divided. We will come back together. The temptation from Satan will always divide. But temptations from God are designed to give you a comeback. And not just a comeback, 
but to come back restored and to come back whole. I've got a word from God from some, for somebody here today uh, to tell you that when the promise says, uh, I don't see uh, where the, the, the answer's coming from. Uh, I see the fire. I see the wood. Uh, where's the lamb? Uh, I've come to tell you that the prophetic voice of God uh, will tell you, I don't know how, uh, but we're coming back whole. Uh, I've come to tell somebody here at Calvary, you might not know where the answer's coming from. Uh, you might not understand why. You're looking at a fractured situation, uh, but God's word to you today is uh, I will restore the years uh, that the locust has devoured you. You're on the journey, Abraham said, Isaac, son, you're, you're everything I've got. All I have left is a promise. Naturally, the temptation is to protect the promise. Do what you can to, to build up something around the promise where then nothing can get to it, to protect it, to hide it. Can't come in here, can't come in there. And it would have been the natural uh, tendency of Abraham and as God asks of him, hey, Take your only son Isaac. I know it had to have gone through the mind of Abraham to protect the promise. That's the natural instinct of the parent. That's the natural instinct of the possessor. I want to protect the promise until I see the fulfillment of what has been promised to me. And naturally the, protect, the, the temptation is to protect. But how many miracles have been forfeited because we protected when God wanted us to prophesy? I see the fire. I see the wood. I don't understand. But the word of prophecy said God will provide. But preacher, you don't get it. I don't know where the answer's coming from. Prophesy anyway. Son of man, can these bones live? I don't know. They've been here a while. Things have dried out a bit. Pieces are not lining up the way that I thought they should. Well, what do you suppose that you ought to do? And the Bible said in Ezekiel 37, Seven. He said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And I will lay sin you upon you and will bring up flesh and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall shall know that I am the Lord. And what did he do? He said, I prophesied as I was commanded. Can I tell somebody that might be in a dried out situation here right now? Come on, what do you suppose we ought to do? You ought to rear back and start prophesying to see the fulfillment of everything that God has promised you. Yeah. I don't understand. I don't know where the answer's coming from. Prophesy anyway. But the situation seems bleak. Prophesy anyway. But they said, I'm not going to make it. Prophesy anyway. But my family's busted up. Prophesy anyway. But I got a problem. Prophesy anyway. Can I tell somebody, in order for you to see the fulfillment of a prophecy, you got to prophesy. The Bible said, as... I prophesied in the moment there was a noise and behold the shaking the bones came together bone to his bone things began to line up the way they were supposed to sinews and flesh came upon them skin covered them but there was no breath in them so he said to me prophesy again but this time prophesy to the wind and I want you to say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, breathe upon these slain that they may live. 
So I prophesied again. And he commanded me as the breath and the breath came into them and they lived. And they stood up on their feet an exceeding great army. Come on somebody when all you've got left is the promise prophesy. Come on Abraham when all you've got left is the word from God prophesy. When all you've got left is the hope of a promise. Somebody's got to rear back and say thus say the preacher, I tried that once, uh, and it seemed like things were starting to line up, uh, but I didn't quite get to the fulfillment. Uh, sometimes, uh, Brother Coffin, you're going to have to go back to it a second time. Uh, come on, there's power in the prophetic, uh, in, in, the, in the second prophetic word, uh, just like there is in the first. Uh, come on, you'll get everything to line up just right, uh, but in order to get things to come back to life, uh, there are times you might have to prophesy again. I've come to tell this church, uh, rare back, uh, throw you your head back and say uh, this is the word of God and I'm going to walk in it and all you've got left Abraham is the promise prophesy another thing that I noticed out of this text is that the mountain is a place of transition Bible said, verse number 9, they came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order. He bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. The mountain is a place of transition. Moses received the Ten Commandments there on the mountain, Mount Horeb. When God destroyed the earth with a flood, when that dispensation transitioned, the ark settled on Mount Ararat. Elijah at Mount Carmel. Israel transitioned out of idol worship. As part of his temptation, Jesus was carried to a high mountain. And of that time, the time of his temptation, it is said that he went in full of the Holy Ghost, but came out in the power of the Spirit. There was a time... There was a transition. Something happened. Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. The mountain is a place of transition. And Abraham is standing there on the mountain. In that moment of transition, looking at his future, Sacrificing on the altar of a promise. And he had a choice to make. If you're not careful, at the moment of transition, you'll plunge a knife into the heart of your promise. Listen. When God summoned Abraham, I found this very interesting today. When God summoned Abraham to offer up his son, notice in the very first verse, God called his name once. He said, Abraham. Abraham said, here am I. But when the angel calls on Abraham to stop at the moment's notice. He calls his name twice. Abraham, Abraham. And then he says, here am I. Abraham is only asked once to raise the knife. But he has to be asked twice in order to stay the knife. 
See, temptation from Satan are designed to wound. But temptations from God are designed to bring you to a place of worship. And if you're not careful, you'll stand at the moment ready to transition to your moment of worship. How many people, how many miracles have been lost because we heard the first voice of God that said, go to the mountain. Go to the place of transition. Go to the place. We're fixing to move from, from one dimension to the other. And how many churches have gone to the mountain expecting a moment of transition, expecting a new dimension of revival, expecting a new dimension of anointing, only to get there and not hear the voice the second time that said, do your promise no harm. I have provided in your moment of weakness, in your moment of worship, I have provided a sacrifice. Oh, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I have provided a way for you when you thought nothing, when you thought all you had was just a promise left, when you thought there was nothing left for me to hang on to, I'm taking my only promise, the future, everything God has, 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 has promised me, I'm taking it and putting it on the altar, and it seems as in this moment of transition, I'm about to plunge the knife and put the death grip on my promise. And I, I, I've come to tell somebody here today, and don't you lose sight on the fulfillment of what God has promised you. He will provide a ram in the thicket. Come on, he'll understand. He knows. Come on, now I know that you fear the Lord. Now I know that your faith and your confidence is in me. Why? Because when it came down to it, you were willing to risk your future. In the moment, in a moment of worship, what you thought, well, this must be the end for me. The reason Abraham said nothing back to God was that he already knew if I kill my promise, he's going to raise it back to life again. Can I, I, I don't know how long you've been waiting. I don't know how long that you've been pursuing. But can I tell somebody today, don't give up on your promise. You're going to be tempted. But if you give in to that temptation, wounds will come out of it. A wounding will come. Yeah, that's what, the, that's what your enemy would like for you to do, but if you'll give in to the temptation of God, He'll bring you to a place of worship. Would you stand with me tonight? The Bible said in Genesis 22, verse number 14, Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. You got to be able to decipher and differentiate between the temptation of your adversary and the testing of your God. Because when God tests you, ask Job, I'll come out twice as good as what I went in. See, the temptation of your adversary, I'll take everything. Leave you with nothing. But when I succumb to the temptation of God, I'm coming through on the other side with more than I could ever imagine. 
Can I tell somebody today, don't give in to the temptation that said, I'm going to try, to, I'm going to sacrifice my promise on the altar of inconvenience. I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice my promise on the altar of the temporal. I'm going to sacrifice, no, 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 no. I'm going to hang on to what I've got and know that when I come through this ordeal, I'm going to have twice as much as what I had going in because my God shall supply would you raise your hands all over this place today? Come on, lift your voice. Why are you so quiet, Abraham? Why are you so quiet, Abraham? I got my promise. Right, but he, he's about to take that from you. I, I still got my promise. Can I tell somebody you can stand flat-footed in the face of adversity so long as you still got your promise? I haven't seen the fulfillment of what I really want to see yet, but I still have my promise. Would you raise your hands again all across this house as they begin to sing? I surrender all. Don't forfeit the miracle because you tried to protect it. Everything. Prophesy to it. I know it's been a while, but prophesy again. I know it might have been a minute, but would you prophesy again? I know things might have things might have calmed down a bit and the pieces aren't lining up right, but you reckon you could prophesy one more time? Could you prophesy to the wind? Let there be a breath of God sweep across this house today. Let there be a fresh fire, fresh revival that would ignite in this house tonight. God, as we surrender everything to you, I'm giving it all to you, Jesus. To you. Yes, God, yes, God. I give. 